Brilliant. My name is Alex Afrie, and I pastor a church about 25 minutes from here. And uh, I'm part of the Freedom Hill Cluster. Really want to honour the apostolic team. Know many of you for many years. I think Tony since the early 80s. Um, Dave Cape since the early 90s. Uh, Louis and Edna since the late 90s. Want to really thank and honour Louis and Edna who've walked with us over the last 10 years, Dorcas and I, and with our church over the last seven years when we went through the toughest time in our lives. And so it's a blessing to be a part of the Church of the Nations. Amen? In the Oxford English Dictionary, uh, multicultural is defined as relating to or containing several cultural, cultural or ethnic groups within a society. And uh, if we are to actually begin to, to see our multicultural societies and communities reached, which is what we see now across the world with the spread of people all across the world, then we're going to need to have that heart of compelling love that we see that Paul had. And when we think about Paul, what was his motive in planting multicultural church across Turkey and Greek, uh, the Greek world as, it, as, uh, as we know it today in the modern world? He was compelled by love. So the first thing we need to have in our hearts, which we've been thinking about already today, is that compelling love of God in our hearts, relating to God face to face, knowing him as he really is, relating to him, so that actually where we're like Jesus when we come into a situation, we have compassion and our hearts are melted for whoever those people are and whatever those pe wherever those people come from. And you think about Paul, what a, what a challenge for him as a Pharisee of Pharisees of the tribe of Benjamin, then he was coming and breaking out of his cultural norm into a kingdom culture that reached out and touched hearts and lives. The second thing, I don't think it's coming up there, but never mind. The second thing was the cost. And um, um, we were in the ancient city of Ephesus in August, and Dorcas and I, we walked through the stone streets of Ephesus that was dug out of the ground in the 1950s. And it was just such an amazing ex spiritual experience to just experience, wow, this is where Paul actually was. This is where his, his friends were arrested. This is where he preached. They could even point to us the cave that they believed that Paul had to live in for a lot of that time because he couldn't live in Ephesus without being persecuted. And we see there, don't we, an incredible um, cost of that. I think there is a picture of Ephesus up there if we get there. Um, and uh, next one, yeah, cost, picture. <laughs> okay, so, um, <laughs> and uh, I'm running against the alarm here. No? <laughs> and so we see Paul, and that, I really felt that when I was in Ephesus, wow, you know, we think of Paul as this great apostle, which he was, and yet, actually, it was cost, cost, cost to see those things come into being. His life was under that kind of pressure. So what is the vision then that we need to have uh, to see in a multicultural world that we have now, to see actually multicultural church? What's the vision? Well, the vision is the vision of heaven. Because when um, Paul visited heaven, remember that? And then he started reproducing this kind of church on the earth. John visited heaven. And what did he see? He was weeping because no one could open the scroll of the destiny of the nations. But then one was seen that could open it. And he was uh, a lion of the tribe of praise of Judah, uh, the root of David, kingship. And yet there he was, a lamb slain from the foundation of the earth. And with his blood, he purchased men from every tribe and tongue and nation and people. And so we see there a sense of the, the love of the strength of leadership, yet at the same time, the meekness and sacrifice to see those things birthed and come into being. And uh, so we see there um, in Revelations 9, 7, the, the vision of heaven. After this, I looked and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count from every nation, tribe, people and language, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. And they were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hand. That's a vision of heaven that was being brought onto the earth. Now, if I think about our city here with 8.6 million people in it and do you know, every one of the 195 uh, countries identified by the UN, apart from two, lives in London. So we don't have to go anywhere to reach the nations. We can reach them right here, right now. Amen? And we can advance the kingdom. So, and then there are 285 nationalities and I think over 700 distinct language groups across the world. So we've got plenty of nations and languages and, and people to reach. And uh, there's a diagram up there will be that just shows that um, I think 9.1% 
are Indian born in London. 5.3% uh, are Polish born, 3.7% are Nigerian born, then Irish, Bangladeshi, Italian, French, Jamaican, Romanian. So you can see, London, it's all here. Come to London, help us extend the church in London. That's just my little advert there, okay. <laughs> if, if you feel called by God, okay. <laughs> so we, we had the challenge in London of uh, reaching out to all these different nations. Now, to be truthful, we mainly reach uh, British-born Asians, blacks, whites, etc. Um, and so I just wanted to think for a few minutes about the how. How do we break down the barriers and reach um, different cultures? Um, well, I believe that a multi- cultural leadership will be needed for a multicultural congregation. As we know, Maxwell says everything rises and falls on leadership. And I've seen in my experience that having served um, on a number of different teams over the years, um, I believe that God has called me to, to bring difference together. And I was born of an English, I was telling Ken, just Ken and Anne just now, that I was born of an English uh, white mother and a uh, black African Ghanaian father um, in the 1960s, uh, born in Ghana, and then grew up from eight months old in this country. So you can imagine in the 1960s, yeah? <laughs> and, uh, and I had an interesting situation because I went to a, a, a primary school that was a private primary school, so I was with very middle class people there, but I was living in Peckham Campbell, a very working class kind of West Indian uh, and white working class background. So when I was going to the school, they said, why are, you, why are you talking like that? And then as I picked up their accent, I went back to Peckham, why are you talking like that? <laughs> so it was interesting. I've always found myself in those situations where um, I, I seem to be bringing difference together. And at the age of 17, I became part of a church plant um, with an American white pastor, David Cassidy, who Tony knew very well and used to come in and speak to us in those days. And I noticed how he was able to attract black and white, working class and middle class, um, as he accepted and celebrated difference. And I've always been quite comfortable with that. And we saw the church then grow from 14 people to 60 people in about six months. And then after that, it grew much more as well. And um, I became, I was raised up into eldership at that time. They used to call me the younger because I was only 19 years old. And, um, and we had... <laughs> Not the elder, no. And we had many different um, people uh, in the congregation, which was great. But the fifth thing I wanted to say is there is difficulties with that. Let's not pretend it's not difficult. It is difficult. Um, and once our pastor had, had left, um, a, a new pastor came in who was much more introverted and less kind of kingdom-minded. And uh, I noticed that he had an exclusive group that was similar to him. And slowly, those who were different slowly felt isolated and then disappeared. Um, I had gone from the church by then. But then after a few years, the church just shut down. It became so small and so tiny. And so we need to have a big heart if we're going to see difference come together and we're going to see the best out of difference. So what are the difficulties? We can have a sense of threat of difference. When something's different, we can feel it's wrong. And so it's actually getting past that and breaking that and being like Jesus with the woman at the well who could sit there with her with total difference and yet somehow win her heart, um, who sat with tax collectors and sinners and ate with them, who ministered to Gentiles. He was breaking out of the norm, but we know because of Jesus' incredible heart of the Father towards us. And then there can be misunderstandings because of different language. And I'm not necessarily say, saying we may all be speaking English or one language, but there's a difference in what we mean. And so we misunderstand each other and our social norms might be different. And so we have to break through that so that we can understand again each other. Um, and uh, I think it was um, the president of uh, Merrill Lynch who, who said, even about business, um, it... Uh, even business is recognizing the commercial benefits of having diversity and actually causes business to grow more. I think that was uh, Merrill Lynch said that. It has to come from the top, um, it was said, so that actually you can see the difference. Um, and then it can take longer, I found, to come to solutions when you're actually trying to come to a solution because we're all coming from slightly different understanding, but it can take time to come to a solution, and yet the solution you come to is better. 
Um, in Harvard Management Communication Letter, it was said that immigrants have always been an important part of the US workforce, and their contribution is growing. They bring with them a wealth of knowledge and expertise that is invaluable to business. So if even business recognizes this, I believe that's a kingdom principle, then as the church, we need to realize actually, with diversity and difference, it can create something even better and create something that can reach even more people. So I think this is important for London at this time. It's important for the UK with all the movements of people and the different kinds of people, the Netherlands, the USA, Canada, South Africa. I think for all of us, we have to have that heart that can reach out because this gospel of the kingdom must be preached to the whole earth and then the end will come. Amen. And that bit is about the end, isn't it? <laughs> In my experience, I have found that a leadership team with different cultures must celebrate those. They must celebrate the difference. And this way, the whole church feels released to be the unique people of God. And a multicultural leadership must be willing to listen a little harder to each other to gain understanding. It was John Powell, the theologian um, in the 17th century, who said, Listening is a search to find the treasure of the true person as revealed verbally and non-verbally. I'm going to go to the, to the last sentence. I will have to reshape what you have said and check it out with you to make sure that what left your mind and heart arrived in my mind and heart intact and without distortion. Amen? A little bit more listening and then we gain true understanding of each other. This reminds me of a South African friend of mine who came over a few years ago and he wanted to publish a book with, uh, with Monarch and he went in there and he gave them the manuscript, I took him in and the, the, the British uh, publisher looked at him and he said, hmm, this is quite good. And uh, he thought he didn't like it because quite good didn't translate as really good <laughs> to him in, the, in, the, in his mindset. So he came out and he was sure, and he was trying to persuade the guy. And when he came out, I said, no, don't worry, he likes it, he likes it. And he, 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 he couldn't see that he actually liked it. And, uh, but anyway, he realized that quite good from an Englishman meant really good, yeah? <laughs> and the book was published, so there we are. So sometimes we have to listen a little harder to understand each other, even if we're speaking the same language. And those can be the difficulties when you're working with difference in a leadership team or in, in a church. Um, so in a leadership team of this sort, we need to see the norm as difference. And so we take the different cultures, the different music, the different ideas, and they come together and they form something beautiful. So we, um, the way, one of the ways we do that is by having um, homogeneous units, i.e. different life groups that may have difference in them, whether it's um, ethnic difference or youth culture or young adults or it may be elderly culture, but then we all heterogeneously get together on a Sunday morning and celebrate the difference and share testimonies from that. So actually, that's all building together and creating something beautiful. Okay, sixthly, what are the opportunities? Oh, I don't know what the time is. No, I'm still okay. <laughs> the bell's not gone yet. <laughs> um, and uh, what are the opportunities for growth? Um, okay, those are the difficulties, but what are the opportunities for growth? I think through working together as leaders and churches with others of different cultures, I believe we can reflect the nature of the Trinity in, I'm going to use a theological word, perichoresis, which is very similar to that, what Steve was talking about, about the Father loving the Son, and the Son the Father, and the Father give ways to the Son to do this, and the Holy Spirit to play this role. And so actually we're getting the best out of our relationships um, of oneness. With, so there's, there's diversity in unity, amen? The unity of the Son and the unity um, of the Father and Holy Spirit. And so this affects the church in that people relate to different members of the leadership team or eldership um, and can see the team honoring each other. And so they say, okay, this is a place I can be. There's someone there who looks like me or there's people there and they're all relating together. This is the beautiful colorfulness of God, the poetry of God or the dance of God. And so we had a white couple come into the church recently and they said to Dorcas and I, you are real role models to us. And I was thinking, what do they mean by that? And they said, well, we can see you as a black couple relating to uh, 
white couples to uh, Chinese couples to, to Chinese people to, to, to black couples, all within the leadership. And so it's actually saying something to us that we can all connect together in this beautiful kingdom of God. And what an example that is when you think about our day with all the kind of um, division and everything that's going on, that the church can speak out. You know, multiculturalism, I believe, can only work with Jesus, really. It can only work in the kingdom of God because now we're reflecting heaven and we're reflecting the character of God. So as we, um, so we, recently we had a, a young lady come in who's ethnically Indian, but she's a New Zealander. And uh, she has an incredible heart for hospitality. And so she's just been bringing in recently um, young adults from Canada, New Zealand, Australia. And she's just got this huge, big heart. And so we can take those cultural differences and actually say, what part of the kingdom of God is in that culture? Then that is a kingdom deposit. And we receive that and we take that. And then we say, what part in that culture isn't kingdom, is demonic? And we cast that out. Amen? <laughs> and so there has to be a real working to see the godliness coming together. And so um, in one culture, like the, the British culture, we may see good stewardship and management and all those type of things. Um, or in the Dutch or Germans, we see that, that, that real diligence. And so we take that as a kingdom aspect. But then in, a, in maybe the African or Caribbean um, culture or South American culture, we see that great celebration. And we say, hey, we can celebrate. And we can have that generous hospitality. more. And we take the positive aspects and we receive all that is good and cast out all forms of evil. Amen? Finally, finally, the steps, <laughs> the steps. This is where I, I make seven points in one, the steps. The bell, four minutes to go. Okay, the steps. So if we're thinking along these lines, we need to firstly recognize all people are God's creation and our image bearers. Amen? Secondly, we need to realize, um, uh, as Keith was saying yesterday, that we're all pitiful sinners and we're in need of salvation. Everybody, no matter what culture we're from. And it was amazing how the Moravian missionaries, as you know, as they left and sold themselves into slavery, said, may the lamb that was slain receive the reward of his sufferings. Amen. And so when we bring people of every nation to God, the lamb that was slain is receiving the reward of his sufferings because he purchased men and women from every tribe, tongue, nation and language. Thirdly, uh, as leaders, we need to bring restoration, like we've talked about. What is the redeeming virtue in the culture? Redeem that, bring that in, and disciple out the rest. Amen? Bring that in and disciple out the rest. So we need to restore, as we said, those different aspects that come from the different cultures. Sometimes those things can be misunderstood. You know, sometimes the abundance of food that comes with one culture is seen by another culture as wasteful. Or sometimes the, the, discipline, the discipline of a, another culture is seen as miserly and mean. Yeah, and so we have to work all that through and say, what's the kingdom thing here? Um, then prayer is important. Pray for diversity. You know, I prayed in our church. We were, we were very much a majority white church years ago. And I just prayed, Lord, we need a few black families with black fathers. So there's an example there for the, 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 the black people that, you know, black families can have fathers, you know? So I prayed, I prayed for that. And, and, and they came in. They really can, no. <laughs> okay. And then, I, and then I prayed for, I prayed for more Indian people. I said, we don't have any Indian people here. Let me pray. So then I prayed for Indian, and Indian people started coming in. Um, or ethnically Indian, you know, I'm, generally we're second generation, but you know what I mean. And then, and then I said, where's the Chinese? So I prayed for the Chinese. <laughs> and now, as all these coaches come down saying, Lord, where's the white? I'm praying for the white and the English again. <laughs> we've, got to, we've got to touch the natives. Amen. <laughs> so then the important thing is that we, we, we recognize that and we bring different people. And I don't mean tokenism here. This is in prayer. We bring the different people into our leadership team so that model of heaven can be seen. Yeah. Amen. And so here is our... Core leadership team. There we go. Beautiful, eh? Yeah. Absolutely. They're so beautiful. Look at that. Oh, I know. <laughs> um, and uh, a couple of them work there, so they get their own exclusive photographs here. Next. <laughs> there we go. Some more beautiful people. <laughs> 
And, uh, and what was lovely is that we then began to represent all the different cultures. And then here's a few more pictures of people from the church, just some of the people in the church there. A few more pictures. A few more pictures. There we go. Okay. So it's lovely just to have that diversity. I think it's just the, the multifaceted wisdom of God. And then we need to be... Um, it, not only bring people into leadership, but we need to be led by the Spirit, as I said, so that actually this is something which we're praying through, um, not tokenism, and that it's, like Paul said, he's breaking down the middle wall of division and breaking those things down. And then finally, as we've said, we need to shape and hone character. It's not just personality. It's not just different ethnicities. It's not just gifting. Character is so important to really see a breakthrough. And so we need to... As I said before, recognize what's demonic and cast it out and then disciple what is good um, into being in the kingdom of God. Then we will see the multifaceted faceted wisdom of God made known through the church to the divisive principalities and powers in our world. And then we will see the, the kingdom extended and people will be coming to the church to find out how to make this world work again. Amen. God bless you before the, before the alarm.